Thank you, Carrie. Pleasure to be on with everybody tonight. Um, and, you know, everybody, uh, okay, yeah, you did hand it to me. All right, good. Uh, and everyone can see the PowerPoint, Carrie, right? I don't need to share my desktop or do I? Um, I, let's see. I, I think I just took the um, desktop away. Okay. So, but you can uh, certainly speak, so I think you can. Um... Okay. I'm gonna, let me explain. Well, I want to show the PowerPoint because maybe I'll share my desktop. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we I go. I, got, I just got it. Thank you. Um, so let me, uh, there we go. So let me just set up beautiful. All right. So I'm going to show you guys the agenda to start with. And hmm, did I not grab the, uh, if there's two of us hosting it. Um, okay. I'm probably, I'm just trying to get a hold of the PowerPoint. It's not, huh, it's not moving for me. All right. Oh, there okay, we go. Here we Thank go. you. Thank you. All right. So uh, basically, this is the agenda for tonight. I want to share the arts mission with you for a couple of minutes. And then for a few minutes, uh, again, a small amount of time, talk about a good life, person-centered elements and choice. And then we're going to shift right into adult sports and services. And then what I call mixing and matching, a lot of people, they'll reference patchwork, putting together a patchwork of sports. Um, <clears throat> probably three and four will be talked about together off and on because as I talk about the supports and share them with you, the services, um, I will give examples of mixing and matching. And finally, uh, personal advocacy, which is a really important piece of this. Uh, you do have to, uh, some people are fortunate and doesn't take a ton of advocacy. I think that's very few people. I think, you know, there's a lot of demand, so it's really important for you to make the case. And I'm assuming most of the people I'm talking to are family members. But for those of you that are, are part of this and people with disclose yourself, um, obviously, you know, this, it's important for you to be involved as well. And so without further ado, let's start with the ARC's mission. Uh, it's, you know, our mission is to enhance the lives of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There's about 200,000 individuals in the Commonwealth and their families. Um, actually, researchers estimate in terms of people that require supports from DDS, and this is, of course, you know, figures from probably 2012, and there are incidence figures, but there's probably about 105,000 that need some type of support or care. And of those, uh, somewhere under 75,000 have families as caregivers. So just, just a little overview, what advancement of sports and service, it doesn't just happen um, before the 1970s. There was no special education. Before the 1980s, there was no chapter. Uh, 688. So as you look at this, here's a picture of JFK, who really got the ball rolling in the modern era, uh, signing a bill to combat disabilities. This is several years after the ARC was established in the 1950s. And in that picture, actually, if you take a look next to Eunice Shriver, is the executive director of the ARC of the United States, Gunnar Dibwad. And behind him, the head sticking a couple of, not the woman, but the man, is actually, at the time, he was president of the ARC of Massachusetts. And there's a couple of other ARC leaders there. But, uh, you know, JFK is an emblem for us. Eunice Shriver, of course, uh, did a great job establishing Special Olympics. Uh, go a little further to the next uh, slide. Um, and I don't know, maybe I can grab this, Terry. And okay. I don't know why I'm having a problem. Um, Marty Ford, she's the Director of Government Affairs Office. She's the Senior Officer of Government Affairs. Um, She's there sitting with Attorney General Holder, and on the other side of the Attorney General, former Attorney General Holder, is President Barack Obama. Um, so uh, just to give you a feel for that, the next slide um, is 18, there are 18 affiliates of the ARC across the state. And just to give you a sense, um, you know, we're an umbrella organization, so any of the affiliates might are the foundation on which uh, we work with people, but there's also other organizations that provide services in our field, and many of them also donate to the ARC as well as families, because basically advocacy, um, you know, government doesn't pay you for doing the advocacy, so that's an important piece is getting support from people so we can do the advocacy out there. Um, so that's just a little overview, and um, since I'm struggling with the uh, taking control here, I'm going I'm to uh, leave it at that, but it's also important, hopefully, um, for uh, folks to feel 
that they understand, you know, about the importance of advocacy, both personally and then being part of making a difference overall. Um, so if you could go on to the next one, Carrie, please. Uh, go on. I, I talked about how many people, well, we'll just skip all that. I, so here, I think the basis, um, I don't have a sense, obviously, in the audience of who's got, you know, children versus uh, people with transition age versus uh, adults, but I'm assuming a lot of you are focused on figuring out the adult service world right now. And I think one of the things that changed 20 years ago, you would basically have the perspective, okay, what's out there? How can me or my son or daughter, my brother or sister get some of what's out there, whether it's community residence, a group home, staff department, whether it's a job, a day program, that's how the thinking would be a slot, a place somewhere that they could be. Today, uh, I think we try to encourage people to think more about where are they at, like the picture of the young woman here graduating school, you know, because of 766 and the investment made, uh, it's, I think what families have learned and families have, you know, are an important part of making this change happen as well as good teachers, good adult services folks. Good, good people around us, um, that it's really, someone shouldn't have to uproot themselves from their town and go six towns away to have a good life in the community. And so, that, you know, you may not be able to get everything you want, because none of us do, but can we at least have a benchmark? Can we at least have a person-centered kind of vision of what would be best and um, figure out what that is? And then when I talk about community, um, uh, you can see the definition below. We're talking about extended family, friends, local, and other generic offerings. It's a lot of things. It's a big whole world out there. And we want to figure out supports and services so individuals can live, connect to them versus, you know, being somewhere separate. So that's a little bit about that. So it's really important. You don't have to, you know, it's ideal if, if there is a full-blown person-centered plan because I think that helps you, you figure out, okay, I'm being offered this. Is this at least in the ballpark? of our person center plan. And it's so important, you know, to have a, a baseline to measure against. But if you can't do a full person center plan, at least there should be a plan that um, there's a sense of, you know, one page summary. Here are the things that are important to me as a person with a disability here as a parent. It's, you know, depending upon um, what the different aspects of life are, that would be good to make happen. So that's that's basically just to give you a thumbnail sketch of where you want to start. So, um, and, and again, sometimes um, I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, um, if someone's going to be able to, you know, live on their own and with some staff support and they love the beach, you don't want to pick an option that's obviously miles away from that and maybe once a month is the most they're going to be able to get to. That might be a simplistic example, but it just gives you an idea of what we're talking about. So in terms of services and supports, usually what we think about is employment and day supports, individual and family supports. The picture uh, with the uh, young person down there, probably 16 to 18 years old with the mother and Dr. Emmerich, that's uh, health services and related supports. And then we have, you know, picture referencing bus ride, but it's, it's really what would be under there would be residential or individual supports. And that's basically, you know, the ballpark uh, of supports and major categories of supports we think about uh, when we're talking about adult services and support. One of the, uh, you know, basic times, obviously, to think this through is during the transition phase, and that's between the ages of 14 and 22. And a lot of times um, uh, people don't get the chance to really fully think that through during those years because Schools and entitlement, 766, public, educa public education and entitlement, adult services, there are some entitlements, but not in the way you have them in education. So it's the ideal time to think about community living skills, what's, you know, the future like, is employment full-time a possibility, if not part-time, what are other kinds of day supports that young person can be prepared for as they think ahead for adult life. So let me uh, walk walk through to the next slide. Um, and honestly, like what I'm presenting today is probably really a two webinar uh, process. Uh, but what I'm going to do is, let me just close one of the screens so I can see better. Um, 
this is sort of going to be the heart of the presentation now that we're going to item three. Um, this is the chart. I'm going to walk through it differently than some people some people might traditionally. Um, basically, again, we have traditional services and what we call today participant directed services. Instead of talking about adult services and supports just in that kind of bracket, I'm going to walk through the services that are out there uh, looking at basic benefits, living with family, uh, those that end up living in a residential kind of system, uh, or get individual supports, and then those that aren't necessarily eligible for DDS, but what are the options out there? So first, you know, in terms of basic benefits, um, I think that's something that um, is really across the board that people can have access to who are eligible for disability services. In Massachusetts, there's, there's approximately 300,000 people with disabilities uh, on the Mass Health or Common Health, um, what you call caseload, okay? So, you know, we have about 6 million plus people in Massachusetts. There's probably 10% of them have some kind of disability, but of those, 300,000 are actually um, receiving Mass Health services of some kind. And so those people are eligible for a mix of services. Some of those, and I would assume, also are getting, most, most if not all, are getting Social Security. So just to walk through that basic benefit list, and, and clearly at age 18, it's really important to sign up for these things and starting with Social Security. But I'll do it top to bottom because that's how we've got it broken out. The Mass Health Insurance is key. And if uh, the individual works part-time or more, uh, they, and they meet the minimum eligibility, which I'm pretty sure is 10 hours a week. I'm not going to get into a lot of, by the way, details on this. It's easy to find the details. But uh, Mass Health, it provides health insurance, dental insurance, uh, pharmacy, um, and what's not there is durable equipment and things like that. Uh, and again, through Common Health, you can have access to the same things for uh, a premium, and usually it's very reasonable unless you're making some serious money, in which case, you know, buying it would be both a premium and a copay. Um, but that's a very basic program. And if an individual also has private insurance still, well, that's fine, you know. Um, and sometimes Mass Health will, in fact, pay for private insurance as well, um, especially if your child is in Mass Health. The one of, there's a, a system where the premium will be paid, premium assistance. Um, but it's really important to have a Mass Health because, again, you go to box two, and there's long-term supports and services in Mass Health. And let me tell you what the initials stand for, which you can also see at the bottom of the chart. Um, LTSS, by the way, is long-term services and supports. And the examples, uh, personal care attendance services, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, adult foster care or family care, uh, nursing, continuous nursing, home health nursing, uh, and, of course, the most recently since the autism omnibus bill that we had uh, led the advocacy on in the past year, that includes access to um, augmented communication and includes access to uh, ABA, uh, behavioral uh, training through MassHealth. So those are things that are in play now because the, the uh, law was passed only a year and a half ago, the most, maybe a year ago. So it gives you a sense of how... Um, it evolves, policy too, of services availability evolves. Um, Social Security, uh, again, age 18 is the first thing you want to apply for. And depending upon someone's retired in your family or already receiving Social Security as a parent, uh, the dependent would be able to get uh, that Social Security. If not, SSI would be what he or she would get. So. That's a very important program. Um, it is, you know, what the ARC calls um, Social Security and Medicaid together as well as Medicare. Uh, they call it the lifeline. And in terms of health care, if you do get Social Security or SSDI, uh, folks are then eligible for Medicare as well. So person can get Medicare, Medicaid, uh, very important um, items to have. And again, the sooner you sign up, it will say, well, my son's living with me, he's turning 18, um, you know, I, I don't need to apply for it right away. Well, if you could use those funds to maybe set up a life insurance policy during two or three, four years that 
you don't need the funds, and that allows something for a trust to be developed, whatever, for your son or daughter. So there's, there's things to think about. Again, I don't want to get off the tracks too far because there's so much to talk about. Um, there's housing vouchers, and it's part of housing community development. That's what the HDD stands for. You can see we have acronyms down there, except for LPSS. <laughs> we don't explain what that is. Um, Long-term supports and services, as I said before. And then finally, the ride and reduced MBTA fares. Uh, really basic stuff. I mean, the ride, if you're in a ride neighborhood, paratransit is the other name for it. Uh, we're talking $3 each way. I mean, it's a huge, huge benefit if somebody works or needs to get somewhere. Okay. Um, then moving over to the next box um, is we see in-home services and day employment services. And that's for someone living with family. Um, and so based on the day employment side, those are pretty consistent. Um, obviously, if someone's employed, they don't necessarily need the supports you're seeing there, but what, where they would first go probably is the Massachusetts Rehab Commission and uh, get the initial training for employment. If hopefully it goes well in school, someone leaves school with a job. And then if they're full-time, you know, you may or may not want to be registered for MRC if there's a need for retraining or anything like that in the future. Uh, things are going real well, you probably don't want to bother at all. Uh, if it's a part-time job, then the question is, okay, maybe you go to the Massachusetts Rehab Commission to get a, another part-time job, or maybe um, it's, it's a job that's more involved and you, the individual gets the job, and DBS employment can pick up the ball at that point for further employment coaching. So that there's an agreement between the Massachusetts Rehab Commission and the Department of Developmental Services where if someone's been placed in a job by MRC, and I'm just going to use the abbreviations as much as I can, uh, that CDS would pick up the ongoing job support in outgoing years because that the MRC does have federal funding for the upfront kind of placement, but does not have a big kitty for ongoing job coaching. Um, both those agencies, by the way, have you know over 20 offices across the state, and you would basically, I'm going to be talking about making sure how you get in that doorway in a couple of minutes, but you would be working through an area office. Finally, um, uh, excuse me, an area office, or sometimes in MRC's case, they might be for you right away to a provider of employment training. And then finally, Mass Health and DDS both have what are called day services, and those might supplement someone who's employed, or it might be the full-time activity for an individual. Um, you know, we usually think younger people, adult day health is not suggested because it's a very low key kind of experience. It's more of a someone who's getting ready for the senior years. Um, day adaptation is more robust. It has uh, things such as physical therapy assistance and occupational therapy, usually, by the way, provided by the therapy assistants as opposed to therapists themselves. So therapists do have to write up the plan and do the initial assessment. Um, so that's another, those are, that's an offering that's out there. In the DDS case, what's called community-based day supports uh, that heavily focuses on people having opportunities in the community now. And that's a new development over the past few years again. Um, so there might be everything from volunteering at a pet store, uh, volunteering, not at a pet store, excuse me, that's, that's a for-profit. It would be volunteering at a pet shelter, volunteering at a high school in the area, um, practicing uh, on a computer, if an individual can do that, you know, all kinds of different options, um, perhaps delivering meals on wheels. Um, those are the kinds of activities in community-based day services, as well as being on site some of the time. In terms of in-home support, where they're living with family, and by the way, I'm going to cross over and talk a little bit about not only in-home support, but people who are living semi-independently in the community and not living in a group setting. Um, there's a whole cluster of, of strategies, and that includes things like um, having more of a family support allocation. So if someone's historically gotten support as a young person in a family home, um, and, it's, and he or she's getting older, um, it's very important to negotiate early on. But if, if John stays in the family home, what additional supports could I get? Um, and, and talk about that. And again, I'll get into the nitty-gritty about application in a few minutes. But 
um, support services, um, whether they're in the home or they're in an apartment, they look similar. There's a staff person comes to help take the individual out of the community. Again, thinking about the person center plan, what are the activities that the individual wants to do? What are the kinds of caregiving support he or she might need, depending upon um, you know, the level of support someone might need due to a intellectual disability, due to a developmental disability, due to medical condition, due to behavioral condition. It really, again, relates to that, as well as what's the person's goals? What do they love about you know, the activities they've done historically? What are the things that you know as a family? So again, these supports can be flexible. Um, you can basically, um, when I talk about the participant-directed model, you'll see how you can uh, advocate for funding so that someone specifically does certain activities. Um, so we'll talk about that in a few minutes. The other types of either in-home or semi-independent living in one's own apartment that can be used is the personal care attendant program or the adult foster or family care program. And when it's in the family home, we call it adult family care. And basically, here's the difference. Um, with Mass Health AFC, <clears throat> you basically are talking about a monthly stipend that comes to the home, very much like Social Security. So, and there's basically the level of funding, there's two levels in Massachusetts for AFC. Uh, one level is a bit under $10,000. The second level is closer to $20,000, between eighteen dollars and 19000 a year, just to give you a sense of how big the stipend is. These stipends are provided um, on a monthly basis. So <clears throat> that's important to realize. And then to receive the stipend, uh, there's eligibility, not only financial eligibility, which again, once a person's 18, they're their own, they're responsible for themselves financially, and the family income is not is not included. Um, you have someone with adult family care, they have to have at least one a need in one area of activity of activities of daily living. And what is it what are activities of daily living? Um, mobility, being able to physically get around, uh, bathing and grooming, dressing, undressing, uh, taking medications, eating, toileting, you know, basic um, again categories that are identified. And then in terms of the personal care attendant program, that's totally different model, where basically the state reimburses the individual, and you may be a surrogate for that individual acting. In other words, John, who's you know at home or semi-independently, uh, he's eligible for the PCA program. Uh, he he's eligible because he needs at least has needs in two areas of activity daily living, not just one. And then once that's determined, uh, John would basically go through the process. And, and be evaluated by a nurse. And then nurse would say, okay, John could use 30 hours a week of a personal care attendant, or he could use 60 hours a week or 15 hours, of whatever the magical number is. And at once someone needs that, they also look at things like money management as well, what kind of help does the person need in that area. And it'd be really important um, to be as clear as possible during the evaluation period, obviously of one's needs for support. And then that that, pro, that hours get approved by Medicaid, the evaluation goes in. And uh, basically, the hard work of then finding people to be PCA kicks in as well. Um, there are, you know, across the Commonwealth, we'll tell you again how to find out about where the PCA agencies are as well. Um, let's take a look at my time real quick. Okay, so uh, I think you're getting an idea of sort of the range. What I'm going to do is sort of shift gears. I'm not going to spend time on the non-eligible for DDS. I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, and talk to you about DDS, okay, and um, also advocating. So um, what I mentioned earlier that both Department of Development Services and um, Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission have area offices. And I'll focus on one example, which is DDS more than anything. You have to go through an application process, and again, because of the autism omnibus bill that passed last year, there's now also an adult services for people with autism who also have developmental disabilities, and also included are people with Prader-Willi and Smith-Magenis syndrome. Um, 
in, in both cases, whether it's intellectual disability or developmental disability, you have to first be deemed eligible at DDS. And that process, um, you, you make an application. Your application, you know, just it's mass.gov slash DDS, and you can go on that website and see it'll be a box. If you look at all the list of things, you'll see application uh, up there. Um, you want to fill it out, and then there are regional intake teams that do the application process and do the evaluation. And it's, again, really important to be clear. Uh, <clears throat> they're using, still, I'm pretty sure, MASCAP. It's, you know, I don't want to get too much into what they're using. Uh, for people with intellectual disabilities, they're using what's called SIS, uh, and, of course, sports intensity scale for people with developmental disabilities. Um, and they may use, you know, they're going to need information, psychological tests from previous years for those with ID. Uh, for people with developmental disabilities, they're going to look for other documentation from health professionals around their developmental disabilities as well. So basically that process happens. And then, you know, as you're going through that process, um, you're thinking about what are the range of services, and you basically you get prioritized. Let's say you make the eligibility cut. And that's when you're looking at a range of potential services, uh, some of which I've already mentioned, um, that you get prioritized for. And you have to really make a case. And at the end, we'll talk about the personal advocacy piece of this uh, in order to get the services. Carrie, could you go to the next slide? Um, and it may or may not. I might have you come back. Yeah, go back. I'm sorry. Go back, and then we'll get the participant directed in a minute. So if you look at, let me use this chart here. If you look with me at, um, let's focus on residential for a few minutes, see the housing piece. Um, there's, there's basically uh, categ three categories. And you know what, I'm, I don't want to get at the categories so much, but describe the housing to you. There's traditional service options, as I said earlier, and there's the participant-directed options. Traditional options would be, for residential, for example, would be more like a group home, um, or a staff department, uh, you may need 24-7. And basically, if that's the case, uh, you really need to be priority one to get 24-7. What priority one means is make it really clear that within the year, residential placement is needed. And again, you know, just to be clear with you, that's after turning 22. It's at the age of turning 22 or older, DDS, um, it's it very rarely, I, I guess it happens, uh, but rarely wants to serve people residentially um, before they turn 22. And even after turning 22, it's hard and it's a, it's a process. Um, having said that, um, you know, there clearly is, when we get to the negotiation and the advocacy part, there's ways to make a case for that. Um, the other kinds of, you know, traditional services that sort of you know, are, are out there is the day programs I shared earlier, community-based day sports, uh, day habilitations, which falls under Mass Health. The DDS staff will refer individuals to day habilitation and providers that work, you know, do programs for DDS also provide day habilitation. And then there's employment at DDS when, you know, follow-up job supports needed or, or new jobs needed. I, I look at employment services as sort of uh, the crossing line uh, it's the traditional services, but on the other hand, it also can be a participant direct service. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. But the services that are traditional, whether it's a group home, day setting that's DDS funded, or it's a staff department, they're all done through contracts with providers. You get to pick a place. In fact, um, I don't think I've been told if it's traditional and you have a chance to pick a group home, if you've offered three and you say no to all three, Based on even based on good reasons, they will take you temporarily off off the list, and um, you know people have to start all over. I I don't think that's probably the case. I think you could make an argument that look, none of those fit as long as it's based on what an individual needs. And it's not a good fit. And and on traditional services, let me touch on the housing part of this. What's really hard about the housing, whether it's a group home or staff department, you know you, you're dealing with three different variables. You're dealing with location. So let's say you live in uh, Brighton. And, you know, your location might be great. They might have two wonderful homes near you or staff department in a home near you. 
But then it turns out that the peer group, your son or daughter is 25 years old, and the peer group's between the ages of 42 and 60. So there's three other people, four other people living there, but they're all over, and you wonder about the peer group and social interaction. And the third thing might be the staffing level. So you find a house, right place, right peer group, but geez, oh, your son or daughter needs a little more staffing, and the people there are dealing with a one to four ratio and going out on their own a lot. So there's these three variables I often talk about that can make a difference, especially in housing. Um, which brings us, let me then walk into participant-directed supports. If you want to go to the next slide, um, Carrie. Um, so participant-directed supports basically um, mean this is really true self-direction. In fact, the words participant-directed, self-direction, self-determination, sometimes they're used interchangeably. Bottom line, what that means is you, as a person with a disability, or you as a family member watching out for your son or daughter or friend, um, you can basically develop and manage your own services. You can recruit, hire, supervise your own staff, and the control and responsibility for services shifts to you, and, and basically the person with a disability and or those family members that choose to take on that responsibility. Now, there's two very basic approaches to it. Um, but first, you know, as you see on the slide, you get an allocation in both cases. One's called agency of choice, one's called fiscal intermediary. And both of them require an allocation that you're not actually holding the money. It's not like here's a check for $40,000 or $50,000 or $25,000. Um, no, the check is either at an agency or what we call a fiscal intermediary, FI. And that fiscal intermediary is basically a bank for you and the service. The allocation can purchase anything from employment, support, pay activities, in-home staffing, educational, social recreational, community living, and of course staff for any reason that are, you know, reasonable. And then the two major vehicles that I, you know, said earlier, and it looks like the fiscal intermediary got cut off there, carry when it got transposed up here, is agency with choice and fiscal intermediary. Let's go to the next slide. So go back, I think, and we just, is that the next one? Agency with choice. Oh, agency. So, in the, yep. yeah, employer duties are split between the agency which serves as the employer, formal employer of that staff people that you're going to hire, whether it's for employment or in-home support or maybe it's a semi-independent living apartment. You serve as the managing employer that if you don't like somebody, and, you you know, again, you have to negotiate this with the agency. You want to have good reasons if you end up firing someone because they have, obviously, personnel policies at the agency. And again, this could be actually a two-part webinar. This could have been probably a three-part webinar. Um, we want to give you an overview. Um, and the agency handles the paychecks, the bills, taxes, within the limits of funding. I mean, and that's the other thing. You're going to have a budget. And whatever that budget was agreed to, again, hopefully you have some kind of person-centered plan or even a summary plan, and you figure out how to do it. And then you have a person at the agency usually assigned to you so, in fact, this vehicle feels a little more supportive, okay? Um, and it's a little more friendly in that you're dealing with an agency nearby or in the region that, that has a staff assigned. And within limits, you can access that person. Um, you go to the next one, the fiscal intermediary, Terry. <coughs> um, Massachusetts uses one fiscal intermediary called Public Partnerships, PPL, which is available statewide as an agent. When I say Massachusetts, I'm talking about the Department of Family Services, or DDS. It provides you with budget and reports. It pays bills. And it's through mainly an online price process. Now, they do have people that will talk to you and work with you, but a lot of this is on an online process. Um, you're the employer of record legally, whereas, remember, previously, the HC would choice the agency's employer of record. You coordinate services, unless paying a staff or provider to do the same, and you require us it requires a support broker, which DDS has on staff, um, or a service player working for DDS. You can also hire a private broker if needed, um, and some people too choose to do that um, because it provides sort of an independent process. Um, Participant-directed services, by the way, if you go to the DDS site and you want to learn more about this, 
you go to mass.gov slash DDS, mass.gov slash DDS, trust me it works, and pick the key initiatives is on the left, pick self-determination, and there's a good booklet called Individual Choice, Portability, and Provider Selection, 2010 User Guide. Pick that, download it, go through the user guides. It's, it's pretty darn good. Um, I think they did a nice job with that. Uh, let's go on to the next thing. I'm, I know and I'm looking at the time. It's uh, 7.37, so I'm, I'm going to move myself along a little bit. Um, uh, support brokers. Uh, and this is back to the beginning, so to speak. Uh, if you do go towards participant direct service or even traditional services, and even to decide which one's best, um, a support broker may be helpful in figuring things out. The system can feel like a maze, developing a plan, understanding the train, um, giving independent guidance, helping present your concerns or case, finding the right solution, provider, or package. We have supportbrokers.org, but you can also Google uh, support brokers. You can also call the DDS area office and find out, hey, are there other support brokers compare um, what people are willing to offer? Um, just in terms of the uh, next, let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, I already mentioned that guide, but as you can see, if you get the PDF, you'll be able to get the thing. Negotiation. All right. There is negotiation through the whole process. In fact, I didn't mention the mass health part of it, but let's say you get PCA services and you say, 30 hours? Are you kidding me? My son needs, I want to use the PCA because I can see how that could be matched with some DDS funds and, and an apartment we have found that we're going to help my son pay for and eventually get a HUD subsidy for. Um, but he needs 50 hours of PCA. And you go to BAT, you work with your PCA provider, you go to BAT for this, and, and it's possible. And by the way, when you talk about participant directed or dismissing and matching, which unfortunately I haven't done much of because I've been trying to race through this presentation, um, you have a Someone even who needs robust supports, who needs 24-7, there is a potential negotiating with DDS to get a significant allocation instead of a group home setting to use a combination of mass health and significant DDS monies for a more unique kind of service, maybe with a roommate, two people living together. It's not easy to do in terms of the negotiation process, but people have done it successfully. Um, in terms of negotiation, so in DDS itself, and whether it's DDS, Mass Health, or the Mass Rehab Commission, but again, I'll focus on DDS, eligibility can be an area of negotiation where you just, you know, the individual just misses being eligible, and maybe you haven't kept school records that would have been helpful. Maybe there's a health provider that didn't quite, you know, didn't appreciate how important it was, what he or she said. Uh, you know, so there is an appeal process. Prioritization. And it's really the most common, I think, area where there's an issue. And uh, I think that's where you really go to bat. And what I found is people will document what a day in the life is like and send it not only to their service creator. Uh, by the way, first, verbally, I wouldn't stop with your service creator. That's the person at DDS who's sort of the point of contact initially. Whoever that person is and whoever you're working with, you want to you know, if you're not feeling like you prioritize correctly, you really want to go above that person's head right away to a supervisor say, look, I'm confused. Why, why is he or she a priority two? Or, yes, it's great to get prioritized, but why am I getting no help on employment for my son or daughter, you know? And sometimes it's a funding issue, there's limited funds, but so you don't walk away. You say, well, how soon could we get those funds? Unless it's an immediate need, in which case, yeah, you want to, step it up more. You, but coming back to what I was saying earlier, documenting needs is important. And then finally, writing a letter which reviews the needs um, and daily or weekly activities that are going on that you're doing or someone else is doing and, and explaining the situation in a way where you can't be denied, where it can't be ignored is probably the best way to say it. Because remember, people in these offices are dealing with many people and they're not trying to give anyone short shrift or less than they need. They're, they're basically doing triage sometimes, and you really have to document the case. And finally, before, you know, yes, I would go over someone's head in a nice way and make the case before I wrote the letter, but once you've tried it, write the letter. And again, again, I would be 
diplomatic in writing letter. It's not about someone's trying to do something evil here. You want to make the case in a very uh, diplomatic way, and you also want to ask for a personal meeting when you make that case because, and you probably want to meet with an area director at that point, uh, and then going further through the hierarchy as needed. Um, again, it's probably, it's usually, sometimes people make mistakes, and that's the reason that prioritization hasn't gone well or the level of services hasn't gone well. But most of the time it's because it's balancing different legitimate needs, and unless you, you go through the process yourself um, and, and raise the level of awareness and attention, uh, it's the communication is going to not be effective. Um, okay, 743. Uh, Carrie told me 10 or 15 minutes is good. Let me just uh, sort of end with a couple of things and then let's open it up to questions and answers because I know there was a lot here and you might have some really specific questions about some of the items I presented. <clears throat> um, you know, our value statement from the ARC, and it's the ARC of the United States, the ARC of Massachusetts, the ARC across the country, is persons with disabilities should receive at all stages of their lives the support, encouragement, opportunity, and resources to explore and define how they want to live and who is in their lives and enjoy the same rights and respect for their dignity and privacy as do people without disabilities. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, focus on that value system. Statement. And again, there's an interconnection between personal advocacy and systems advocacy. When we go to ask for more funding, you know, we don't have people behind us calling the legislators, especially their state rep, their state state house um, house member, and state senator. Uh, people don't believe this need out there that there is a need for more money, um, and so it's advocacy for a lifetime. And it's and it's important to realize that. Um, so okay, without further ado, I do feel like I downloaded. A whole bunch of info, uh, but if people want to send some questions through chat, or are you can unmute Carrie, or how do you want to do this? Uh, we just usually have people chat in. I know we did have a question earlier, Leo. Um, okay. Uh, one of the participants was wondering, what um, what is Chapter 766? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So Chapter 766 is the Massachusetts Law on Special Education. It's passed in 1972 or 1973. Uh, it took several years to implement, and that basically um, gives the right to education for kids between the ages of 3 and 22. And before 3, um, there's early intervention. There's a separate state law for that. Both are now federal laws as well. So 766 corresponding federal law is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And what's really, you know, in addition to certain requirements that school systems are supposed to do, um, is the transition piece of it, which in Massachusetts is still supposed to start at age 14, and it's really an opportunity. It's a trade-off. You know, you can focus on academics. That's great. But once you're hitting 14, you also want to be thinking about, you know, employment, volunteer opportunities, um, community living, what are the things. And, again, depending on the level, that it, you know, if someone's got a complex medical disability, they have a very different sort of goal, transition goal, right, than someone who's walking and able to, um, you know, basically, you know, work at some jobs and whatever. But it's very important to take advantage of uh, the special education law under 22. Obviously, over 22, there's the programs of mass health care and entitlement. So once, if you're eligible for personal care attendance, you're eligible for adult family care. And by the way, besides those programs, there's um, also uh, continuous nursing for kids, um, and there's, uh, I think we mentioned day habilitation. Those are all entitlements once if someone's eligible. Okay. Um, thanks, Leo. We have another question. Our son has been in the adult service system for 18 years. We mm -hmm. have, um, okay, I'm sorry, I lost it a bit. Okay, we have requested a copy of his budget several times. Is there right. something that we're entitled to? So, okay, so now is the, uh, if you could chat this back to Terry, I guess I'm not seeing the chat, unfortunately. Um, I guess, um, A, is, uh, is he in a group, is he in a traditional residential setting, like a group home or a 24-hour staff department, or even if it's not 24-hour? Am I right to assume that? So anyway, regardless of the answer to that, I, if you want to do something different, 
Okay. Um, um, yeah, actually, I, she did. She did chat back. Um, yes, he is. We have been trying to okay. move our son for over three years, so he's okay. closer to us with little help from DBS. So However, I, they support I, I've the move. A letter. I, oh, I under- go ahead. Okay. Have, however, they support the move. I understand also that everything needs to be done through DDS. Okay. So what I would what I would tell the folks at DDS. So so this is the hard part. Okay. And this is why it's so important to make more of the system participant directed and free up some of the dollars in the system. Is that the dollars are invested in homes and apartments. Um, depending upon an area director, people are more open about finances and those things than others. What I would do is tell the area director, you appreciate, you've been waiting for three years. I put it in writing and, and I would say, it really would be helpful to know the amount of money assigned to him because maybe we could talk to some other agencies, may, you know, maybe we can at least explore ourselves some houses. And what I would do is find out what are two or three providers near you that provide housing. And I would, inter- I would make the time, maybe you've done this already. I would interview them, you know, and see, visit a house, get, get ideas from others. And it's just a matter of location. Yeah, I would find, you know, one or two, at least have a couple options you look at, and then go back to DDS and say, look, you know, uh, there's just some openings here. Uh, you want to find out how old the peer group is, that kind of thing, um, and then make a case for knowing more about the funding because clearly three years is a long time to wait. Okay, great. Um, another question, are there programs out there for companies to utilize in partnership with DDS or MRC for jobs? So, yeah, just recently um, there's been some new initiatives where uh, DDS invested, and, and MRC has this going on too. So now the question is how they can collaborate. But DDS just invested in five to seven uh, employment developers that want to work with corporations so that there's almost like a funnel being developed where, so let's say uh, someone's in Central Mass, they're trying to broker a relationship with corporations on behalf of all the employment providers in that region. Uh, I don't think we have enough of that. There's a group called USBLN. It's Business Network, the United States Business, I don't know what, Leadership Network, I think, USBLN. And I think there's companies there that actually the ARC and other organizations are trying to work with to have more formal relationships. Um, so um, I know there's companies out there that get recognized for doing good work, and um, and so it's it's. It's, there's not enough of it, but I think there's, uh, with this new initiative, an MRC, Mass Rehab Commission, feels pretty good about the relationships it has, um, and I think there'll be more working together in the future. Okay. My daughter is 17, and we haven't applied for Mass Health. Should we do that now in the hopes that it will increase our eligibility for future services? Uh, so at age 18, or right, right on the day, <laughs> You want to apply for Social Security right away. Um, I'm embarrassed to tell you, but, um, I think if you applied at 17, I, I'm pretty sure that wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't work. But I think if you get the application form first, again, for Social Security, um, and then have it ready to be submitted on the day he or she turns 18, and the same with Mass Health. And uh, usually if Again, assuming nobody is already collecting Social Security, neither parent, if a parent's already collecting Social Security, um, then also that would trigger Medicare um, as a as a third a third benefit. But uh, yeah, you want to go ahead and and SSI part of it would trigger Mass Health automatically as a benefit. Okay. My son already is already eligible for DDS. He's almost 21 years old and in school now. What what I need to what do I need to do now in order for him to get into a twenty seven twenty four seven group home, ASAP once he's out of school? Okay, so is he in a residential school today? Can you chat that back? Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Has she answered? I think that uh, no, difference. he's in. She says uh, he's in public school. Okay. Because that makes a difference in what I'm going to tell you. Okay, that's the only reason I asked that question. So what you're going to need to do, um, 
couple of things. I think you want to look at participant directed as well as traditional services residentially. And I, I think what you want to do um, is already eligible, but, but you've got to go through, have you been determined eligible for adult services? Make sure you've gone through that process. Because uh, there's a difference. Is child eligible and then there's adult eligibility. You, have you told the DDS area staff that you really, you know, want it sooner than later? Residential. Do they know? Are they aware of this? What have they said to you? Okay. You know what I mean? So that's, let me walk this through actually. Uh, and so you want to make sure you share that with them. You may want to write a nice note that says, geez, you know, maybe I haven't been clear. Uh, my hope is, you know, as he's becoming an adult, I can develop an adult living situation for him as a young man. Have they, you know, is he someone who's going to be employed? Do you have a transition plan for him that's been developed at the high school? Because that's important, you know? So those are all things that are going to help. You know, is there a plan developed at the high school that talks about community living? All of those things are essential. But Carrie, I think we probably have to do something, a topic like that, you know, yeah. um, to help people, um, you know, piece different pieces to this. Um, but that's, I hope my suggestions are helpful. That's, those are the kinds of things I would do to okay. further. All righty. Okay. And um, when you were talking about uh, basic rights, I think you mean the, the basic services, you described my family situation. Our son is mm -hmm. 21, and we have been able to provide for him and have not applied for MassHealth or SFI. Does it matter which service we apply for first? MassHealth, mm -hmm. yes, then, then SFI, SSI or, the, or the reverse? Reverse. Please, tomorrow morning. <laughs> I have a close friend actually I was at their house some years ago, and I kept telling the you know friends with the husband and wife that a son, you know, significant impairment. He was uh, already 19 or 20, and uh, and she she was great, she's a great volunteer and a great good friend. And uh, I made the mistake of asking her in front of her husband, if she, and hey, he could have done it too, right? Well, I leave it to her, but she hadn't yet filed the application. So please. Uh, as soon as you can, get an application in for him um, and the mass, so you can also get the mass health supports. Um, and again, and you may have to do a separate, I said you shouldn't have to do a separate mass health application, but I will check in mass health as a customer service office. In fact, if you Google mass health, first place, get the social security thing done. And that's uh, any social security office, they have them all over the place. And actually online, you might be able to do it. And then, uh, the, they go through, and, and it's backdated. By the way, the eligibility, Social Security gets backdated to the day of your application, okay? No, it's not going to go to HAP. It's going to go whatever day is 21st year you applied. And then at the same time, what I would do is Google Mass Health Customer Service, which I know somewhere I have a phone number or whatever, but it's not, you know, it should be easy enough to Google that. And I would go ahead and talk to them and say, geez, I've waited. You know, I, you know, should I be applying at the same time given his age? And, and uh They'll let you know, but usually when it, you know it's it's hand in hand. You get the SSI and then it's automatic enrollment for Mass Health. Okay, um, can you apply at 18 years old for DDS services, yeah. or do you wait until age 22? So do what you I would do is to graduate yeah. at 18 with high school right. diploma, but need support services. Right. So I would, um, yeah. I mean, again, so. Um, I, I would advocate, first place, hopefully you've applied for Social Security, you know, Medicaid are about to do it. Um, I would also, it's still time for the school to help for the preparation for community life. So take a hard look at the IEP, Individual Educational Plan. Take a hard look, hopefully you already have an individual transition plan. Is it really meaningful for your son or daughter? If it's not, you know, really, go, maybe Google some transition plans on the web, you know, if you don't want to. If, if, if you know, if there's no support group out there or a group to talk to you about that. Uh, I do find other parents are great resources as well, by the way. And then secondly, um, what, what I would do is uh, when, uh, talk to, unfortunately, you're going to have to start with the Children's Service Quater, right? That's how DDS works. Your area office, you go to mass.gov slash DDS, just, and somewhere on those two margins, you'll see area office locator or area, you know, DDS offices, go to the, if you don't know who your service waiter is for 
you know, they have like 250 people, 300 people, God knows how many cases they have. I would go ahead and, um, you know, find out the name of that person, email them, say who else can you talk to in the office, and then secondly, find out who the family support provider is in your area and talk to them about increasing the supports. If your son or daughter is 18, you will, and start advocating now. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, they're not going to give the same package of supports they might give to a 22 or 28-year-old, which you have to advocate for anyway, by the way. It's not automatic. But I would, yeah, I would go ahead and, and start advocating for it. Okay. And so it, we do have about three minutes left um, of, okay. for the presentation and questions. So I have two right here for you, Leo. Um, they're both follow-ups. The one about okay. um, wanting residential services for her um, son as ASAP, as soon as she gets out of school. Right. Um, she right. has been working in expressing her desire with DDS, but they said, you know, he's not. There's a priority list, and he may not right. get it as soon as possible. Right. Is there right. some other thing that she can do? Yeah, she can write about how she supports him every day. What are the things they do caregiving wise? Um, sort of do a analysis of the week, the day. Talk about it if he doesn't need a lot of supports. Maybe present it from the point of view of what he might be denied living with you. You know, maybe talk about it in terms of his dreams, his goals, what kind of supports would be helpful to him uh, as a young man, you know, having a roommate or two, you know, who he could do things with, you know, the social connections. Um, the other strat, that, so that's, I would, I would sort of make the case from a dream vision point of view, goals point of view, as well as a caregiving point of view and support point of view. Uh, and I would, you know, do that by describing a few days a week or a whole week. Uh, the other strategy, of course, well, the main thing is to be, you know, consistent with it. Don't let go. Um, and the second thing I would do is um, think about is there a mix of services between the mass health funding, assuming he's eligible. Um, obviously, if he doesn't have two areas of activities that they limit that he's helped in, he won't be eligible for PCA. Uh, if he is only one, he would be eligible for adult family care, and there's some cash, stipend, you know, money that comes through that that could help buy staff support and maybe put a package together, probably with DDS money and with Mass Health money. But um, I would I would take the point of view of where the caregiving support he needs, and then the second strategy would be his dream and vision and how it's impeded if he remains at home with you. Okay. And then another follow-up um, on her 17-year-old uh, daughter. Um, what is meant if we have mass health coverage before 18? Will DDS allocate her more money or services no. after she's 22? Uh, so, so what I'm understanding you saying is she's 17. She already has mass health coverage. Okay. So, um, you know, usually mass health coverage doesn't do anything in terms of advocating with DDS. If anything, it usually works against you. Um, so it's usually negligible, you know, the impact. I think what you want to do is it may mean your daughter has significant support needs. Uh, and I think that's the case you'd want to make. What are the what are the things you might take for granted that you do every day that are significant? And I think you want to make that case. Uh, and again, if you don't have enough that's significant from a caregiving point of view, you want to make the case about what's, what's held back if she had more DDS support as she turns 22. And use, again, your school, the time in school here uh, to develop a transition plan that's effective for her, you know, that, that takes care of, you know, her community living skills, you know, looks at where possible, again, not knowing her and not having enough detail with only 10 seconds to go here. Um, I, I can't give you enough individualized feedback, but I hopefully you're getting the idea of what could be helpful. All righty. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank Leo uh, Sarkisian, our presenter, for this uh, evening, and hopefully we have uh, helped to de demystify some of your questions and about the services. Um, I um, also want to let you know we're having some more webinars coming up, um, and if you're interested in more of the self-direction, uh, Buddy Bostick from the Arc of Greater Haverhill New Report will be presenting a webinar on real choice, real, um, real opportunities for people. So uh, again, thank you so much for attending tonight, and we'll hopefully talk with you soon. I will be uh, emailing you the uh, slide presentation.
after this webinar. So thanks again for presenting. Bye-bye.